there's so many small things we can do. And I know some people think like small things don't matter. And I used to be someone like, I used to be like that in the heydays of my like activism. I was like, small steps don't matter, but they do. If everyone leaves RBC because they're like, fuck you, then okay. They're not necessarily going to go bankrupt. That's or it's going to hurt them. Mm-hmm. It's going to send a message. I'm Colin Burroughs, and this is the Woodstein Media Podcast, Episode 10. This podcast is produced on the lands of the Mississauga, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, and Odawa peoples. Episode 10 features a discussion with Elsa Kappart, director of the feature films Graveyard Alive, Go in the Wilderness, and most recently, Slacks a socially conscious satirical horror that sharply informs on the evils of fair trade, corporate globalization, fast fashion, and, well, you just have to go watch it. It's fun. My partner in this life, Heidi, joined me as we revisited Elsa's films in preparation for this Zoom call. And we have to say, they continued to provoke deep conversations in our house and make us laugh. Although we do discuss the films and series Elsa is developing, a lot of this conversation focuses on her climate activism with XR, Extinction Rebellion, the Ministry of the New Normal, SCALE, Sectoral Climate Arts Leadership for the Emergency, and the Directors Guild of Canada's National Sustainability and Climate Action Committee. During the podcast, you will hear a few songs from Mesmerica, Expect a Circus, by ex Chambawamba member Dan Burt No Bacon, Kyra Wood Kramer, and The Axis of Descent. It's an album I highly recommend and have played on several episodes. Check the links in the description for more information. This podcast and Woodstein Media are independently produced journalism that you can support through Patreon or by donating through PayPal at woodstein.ca. That's W-O-O-D hyphen S-T-E-I-N dot C-A. Thanks for your interest and support. If you enjoy this podcast, you can support it by listening to more episodes, liking, sharing, subscribing, or reviewing them. First of all, for listeners who may not be familiar with you, I'd like you to describe who you are, what you do, the way you'd like to be described. Okay. um, Well, I'm a filmmaker uh, that makes usually strange and supernatural films. I know technically, I guess I'm a horror filmmaker, but my films are not horrific so much as as bizarre and steeped in the supernatural. So that's really my predilection. And uh, I've been making films since my early 20s and worked in the film industry in Montreal to to pay the bills, so to speak. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. I'm okay. from Montreal, born and raised in Montreal, English and French speaking. My father was American and my mom's from France. So I'm a real, I'm a real mutt. <laughs> okay. Um, and then on top of your filmmaking, you've uh, been involved in climate action, right? Right. Oh, yeah. For... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was very recent. So in 2018, I read the secretary general of the UN's sort of call for action for climate change and the ecological emergency. And I hadn't really been aware of the gravity of the situation before. I sort of knew vaguely there was a problem. And so that really prompted me to act. And so I dove deep into climate activism and I've been doing a bunch of stuff um, until recently. And then now I'm in Morocco because I spend a part of the year here with my husband so that's been on hold because i can't really do much out here nor would i being political here is much more dangerous than in canada so for our our well-being i'm i'm staying put okay well i want to talk a little bit of your history of action here in canada um 
Cinema for the Climate, was that where you started bringing in the climate action or were you doing it before that? No, I started really in 2018. I went to a march in Montreal and the speakers at the end were talking about Extinction Rebellion. And I was like, oh my God, this is like what needs to be happening. Not, I wouldn't say naively, but in a way I got really fired up and I I had never really done any activism before. So I started the Montreal chapter with two other guys and we like dove right in and gave classes. And I mean, not that I knew anything really, but gave presentations, I should say, and then started doing actions probably six months after. So I was with XR for about another year. And then the pandemic hit and everything sort of fell apart. And then myself and another activist who I'd met through Extinction Rebellion started another group called the Ministry of the New Normal, a a female affinity group. And that was much more, much closer to what I do. So we had characters, we had like a narrative, we did little videos, we did actions as our characters. So we did that for two years. And then my life really changed when I started to go to Morocco more. And so my, the group sort of, well, disbanded informally. We weren't like, we're done. We're just like, well, I'm one of the leaders. I'm not here. The other women all had different priorities at that point in their lives. So that's, and cinema for the climate. I mean, to be honest, it's not really that active. It was more me being like, we need to do something in cinema and trying to recruit friends to help. And then realizing it's too much effort for very little return so I, it's still on my website maybe i should take it off okay but it's not but it's not because in a way it gives people resources it's sort of also linked i i was i mean i'm still a member of the dgc's the director's guild of canada's climate action committee but now that i'm in morocco i can't participate the meetings are too late in the day and so when i'm in canada i participate and I was I I was on that committee since I think the fall of 2020. And so I ended up coming up with tips for filmmakers and putting that on on my website. And that's sort of the extent of what that is right now. Okay. So what do those tips look like? What changes are you hoping to see? Or is the Directors Guild uh, Sustainability and Climate Action Committee hoping to see with these tips or what does that look like? On, well, uh, they really want to reduce the, the carbon footprint of productions. Productions are extremely carbon intensive, film, film and TV productions. So it's, and because film is always in like an urgency mode, it's really hard for people to stop and sort of plan initiatives to reduce their carbon footprint. But because it's a lot of studios have started to do it and, and really implementing it in their practices and what they expect from service productions, I think it's been trickling down to Canada. Um, I mean, it's like every, everything from changing your fleet to EVs or reducing the, the size of the cars used to using tie-ins instead of diesel generators, uh, making sure to reduce food waste because that, that's a big producer of methane in the dumps, reducing paper, you know, reducing flights. So basically reducing inefficiency and uh, also in the art department, making sure that instead of throwing away sets and props and that everything is recycled and repurposed and goes back into the chain, the consumption chain. So it's really a different way to, to see a production. And the DGC wants people to really start thinking about it from the beginning. So even before going into production, like as you get the money, you, you sit down with all the heads of departments and it's usually a someone higher up, like a producer or director, who's going to be the driving force and say, well, this is really important to me. And this is what each department should be looking into to reduce their carbon and waste footprint. So, I mean... It's hard from what I understand, but they they keep plugging away. They have a really good website and I think they are making some headway. I know in Vancouver, they're pretty advanced. Quebec, not so much, but um, but it's with filmmakers who aren't going to decide to to take that into account from the beginning, like from the conception of the production setup, basically. Okay. If, someone, if no one leads the way, then the departments are not necessarily going to do it. Or if one department does it, you know, that's not really enough. Or if like a coordinator wants to do it, but no one else does, then he or she are by themselves trying to to force people to change and they don't really have the power to. So 
So your films are, you've worked on big ones as a crew member, but on your films, they might be a little smaller, but has there been a big change in the way things work on your sets since you started or? Well, to be honest, like Slacks was made just as I was sort of awakening to this crucial need and so no we didn't really do much on slacks because we shot slacks in february 2019 i actually didn't know as much about uh, production sustainability as i did as i do now um and i haven't shot another film since so but but hopefully knock on wood um the next one then yeah i'll, I'll talk to the producers and i'll make sure that that's part of our game plan that okay. we then, you know gather all the the up-to-date information and and uh, disseminate it and have meetings and and make sure that everyone's on board even when they're hired like you can make sure that when people are hired you tell them that this is one of your goals and if they're on board great and if they're not then they might not be the best person but it's hard in film because you want to pick the best craftsperson and then hope that they're also on board with the, your sustainability goals which is not always the case but I haven't tried yet, so hopefully they'll all align. And it does look like you have a few things on the horizon, a few series, if your website's up to date, potentially coming along. And It's in development, so it's hard to say, you know, like yeah. I can, I have so much in development, but I've, there's a lot of projects that I had, I worked on very hard that never got made. So I'm always a bit hesitant to be like oh this is going to be the next one because then i'm like so sure and then it's like no actually this doesn't work but yeah i am developing i have three tv shows and then another two features at really various stages of development and i would say two of those tv shows have a environmental or climate action perspective but there are you know one is a supernatural mystery and one is like a violent satirical comedy Okay. It's not, it's not a horror. There's no supernatural yeah. elements, but it's definitely like bloody and over the top. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Extinction Rebellion. And uh, well, we'll start there. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what that is and what your participation in that was? Yeah. I mean, so Extinction Rebellion, also known as, known as XR, came out of the UK. And it's a nonviolent civil disobedience movement. So it adopts the model of disruption, nonviolent disruption of society in order to get governments, usually governments or corporations, to react to the climate emergency. So this was done a lot in the civil rights movement, in the anti nuclear movement, um, the suffragette movement. So it has a long history of working. And XR in the UK was quite active for about two years. And then obviously the pandemic sort of smashed it. And now from what I understand, they're still active, but um, not as disruptive. So the idea of disruption is to sort of force the issue into society. So you do disruptive actions and then you get press coverage and then people go, oh my God, there's a climate emergency. But to be honest, like I'm really sad to say that even though that has helped because it, it's helped galvanize people's uh, realization of the climate emergency. It hasn't done much to move governments, certainly not corporations. Um, I think we're in a much different society now than we were in the 60s. Not to say that civil disobedience doesn't work. I think it does work in certain points, like the, the Ferry Creek blockades. You know, it works for very, very specific problems, but so something so huge as what is causing the climate and ecological breakdown, which is our modern way of life. <laughs> it's sort of hard to stop it by doing, by blocking society, unless everyone, like unless a, a huge number of people, they say 3%, which doesn't seem like much, but is, is quite big, of people block society, block the functioning of society until government takes action. And when I realize the extent of the climate emergency. And I was like, oh my God, of course this is gonna work. People just need to know and they will come out of the street and get arrested. And that wasn't the case. People were like, yeah, I know it's a problem, you know, but whatever, what are we gonna do about it? And I was like, well, you could join us, you know? 
And they're like, well, I don't know. I don't want to get a police record. I want to go to Cuba. This, like, I know I'm, I'm sounding like a bitch, but that's basically what, what I was said to me a lot. And it was very discouraging because like, I can see the effects of climate change in Morocco and it's people who've done very little to cause this are suffering the most, you know, like including my husband and his family who were nomads and a lot of them had to give up their nomadic lifestyle because of the drought in Morocco. So I don't know, to be honest, right now I'm like, I'm in Morocco, la la la. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Maybe I'll just make crazy films with that message. And, you know, maybe diving into activism was helpful to sort of open up my eyes and give me a new perspective. But I don't know, coming back to Montreal, what I'll do, because I, I don't think that movement is really active anymore that much. And Quebec is a very passive society, so people don't get mad really that much. They're like, you know, don't make trouble. <laughs> like, they're not like France where, you know, you move a comma in the constitution and they're like up in arms and everything's blocked for, for weeks and weeks, which is both good and bad, I guess. But the it's not a funny society. Thing about you saying <laughs> that is where I am in Ontario, we talk about Quebec like, whoa, those people get mad. We don't get <laughs> mad. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> I guess it's always compare and despair, right? But yeah. I mean, we were a small group, but what we found was that it was really people who almost were outside normal society. Maybe that's how it is everywhere, but who got so mad that they were willing to do something about it. But like everyday people, like in France, like the Gilets Jaunes, they really disrupted society and that was from every angle. But in Quebec, unless, I mean, it's it's good that we make noise, but we're very few, like the rest of society. They'll come out for protests and stuff, for like peaceful marches, but they won't do anything that disruptive. Okay. And it's just a perception. In this, and in perceptions, um, words like emergency, they get thrown around and then it seems they get absorbed or whatever. And even the corporations who are perpetuating this will use the word emergency but they they won't you know change their actions their own actions to show that it is an emergency and it is something that people should be treating like their house is on fire yeah the the way that those things get absorbed i i guess what i'm saying is it seems like those can be really frustrating to people who want to make a difference and how do you feel about that well i'm not surprised like corporate corporations are pretty much evil monsters even though i wasn't a climate activist ever since i was quite young i've been bizarrely aware of corporate evil like i have no idea why i had my parents were have never been activists and were well that's not true i guess my father went to the Peace Corps to avoid Vietnam. So there was sort of like a rebellious streak in the family, but they certainly weren't too aware of or concerned by corporate malfeasance. Yeah, I'm not surprised because if they co-opt it, then it doesn't feel like an emergency anymore. It's the best way really to make it less of an emergency if they adopt it in their, their lingo, like carbon neutral. Now everything is carbon neutral, but that means nothing. That means absolutely nothing. It means that they vow to plant trees, who cares? <laughs> like, wow, you know, you keep making Coke bottles, but you plant trees and the Coke bottles end up in the ocean and you use petrochemicals. That, like, it's all bullshit. I mean, that's what Slacks is about. Yeah, It's they... frustrating, but it's not, It's I'm not surprised. I, I guess in a way it's not frustrating because I'm not surprised. What's frustrating for me is people's inaction, people who don't really think this is their problem and who just continue with their lives as if it was business as usual, you know, that something that affects us all and is going to affect us all very much sooner than we think. I mean, is it, like last summer was a nightmare with all those fires. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's only going to get worse. Like, I don't understand what people don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> it, and I mean, I look out like my window and the weather, a winter around where I am has completely changed. And mm. it, it's, not like we have one winter that's a little different than the other ones and then it goes back to how it was before it, it's progressively been changing and it, we used to never get 
as much rain in January and February as we're getting now. It used to all be snowstorms and the climate around here is, <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's fucked, fucked. up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's totally different than it, it was years ago when I was growing up. And we can see that and we talk about that, but it seems people talk about it, but are not prepared to do anything more than talk about it a lot of the time. It's it's not something that's going to change if, if we're no. not willing to do more than talk about it. Um, no. Can you tell me more about sectoral climate arts leadership for the emergency? Yeah, that was, well, that it's also something that because I'm in Morocco, the meetings are too late um, and it's also morphed. So I sort of lost track of it uh, after I came here. That was started by some key figures in the art world. And it's basically to try to leverage the power of the um, cultural industry for change. So they do a lot of lobbying there's a lot of members like theaters and museums it's more i don't want to say corporate but it's it, you know it's established art organizations who are rallying together to push for change in the government in in the arts funding they want to, the government to fund arts that addresses the climate emergency so it's a real i would say they're pushing for like a shift in perspective and what the arts how the arts can affect people to really come to realize that this is an emergency i know talking about an emergency it's ridiculous because it's like if this was an emergency we'd be doing something about it yeah my friend anthony garofellas Auger, who i co-founded xr with was one of the co-founders i don't know if he was a co-founder but he was definitely one of the early coordinators of scale so he got me on board but like at first it was trying to brainstorm and do actions and stuff but now I'm not sure what they're doing. I feel like being out here, I've really like stepped out. But it's it's at least to say it's it's encouraging that people in the arts who you wouldn't think would be necessarily activists, they really feel very deeply. Obviously, artists feel deeply. That's why we're artists, and so they're willing to really re-examine how they create their work and the impact their work has on. The environment and climate so that's another part of what scale is is like trying to implement like the dgc basically like how to reduce our carbon footprint by making art different kinds of art and there's a lot of stuff going on in the arts there's a huge a huge upswing like groundswell of people who who want to change how the arts are made and what the arts can do to address the climate emergency so yeah it does seem like in the arts there's always people who are thinking a little more progressively and want to be more inclusive, want to tackle many of the social problems that we have. Standing on a chair, a precarious chair, we're at the end of a very short rope. We don't want your thoughts or your prayers or your hopes. We want you to act like the house is on fire. Cause it is. Cause it is. Help. Help. The world is on fire. Cause it is. Cause it is. Help. Help. The world is on fire. And we need a world of helpers too. Help us down from here. That was Precarious Chair, The House is on Fire, by Dan Burt No Bacon, Kyra Wood Kramer, and The Axis of Descent. Yeah, the other thing is your movies watching your movies again and we noticed a theme that might have been totally intentional going all the way back to graveyard alive which you told me you, you're getting a 20th anniversary uh, yeah release re-release on blu-ray <laughs> okay um 
so the one theme and it may have been totally intentional but we noticed it more because um gaslighting is it's one of those phrases that's in the media all the time now and the character of goody two shoes who we find hard to like but um (laughs) we we were very sympathetic because all throughout the movie she ends up being told you know she's hallucinating she's paranoid or crazy so Mm -hmm. we viewed it with that eye on modern Mm -hmm. media and was that something you were thinking about when you were writing it way back then or I didn't even know the term gaslighting I mean I just know that that's how women have been treated for centuries um so it just came out naturally it's like she's trying to tell the truth or or bring out some form of truth and she's just being told she's crazy so to me it was just like business as usual for for the ladies <laughs> which is sort of sad but no it's interesting that you picked that up because i think in go in the wilderness that theme is definitely there as well mm-hmm. and slacks too of course yeah okay yeah we got through uh graveyard alive and go in the wilderness last night and we're gonna rewatch slacks Probably tomorrow night after work. Oh, a mini Elsa Kefar festival. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, we love it too. And we're excited, yeah. hoping, hoping some of those things you have in development get picked up and go through. And two years I've been working on some of these these suckers for like 20. One was 20 years. Oh, one is like 10 years and one is pretty recent, but then another is about five six years i guess including another draft it's almost 10 years i take a long time well great hair life is done very fast but the other ones were were not so it takes it takes a while but i hope so i hope especially the environmental ones get made because i think those are really relevant so those are the ones that i most like to get made i guess i kind of heard a connection there when you're um working on getting a film or a series made it seems like things go slow when people may not always pick up on what you want to be putting out there so is is that something that kind of already receiving that sort of treatment when you're trying to get your work out there is that something that you can connect to the way that people react to climate action because there's maybe a similarity of people not always picking up what you're putting down right away or Mm, i'm not it's interesting question i'm not sure it's the same it comes from the same place i think for me you know until before i made slacks people didn't really take me seriously but i think partly it was because i was a woman because there was a lot of there was a lot up till, you know, five years ago, I would say. Uh, there was still not a lot of women directors. Women weren't taken seriously. There's definitely unconscious bias in uh, financing. And also in Quebec, no one made genre films. I was an anglophone. So I sort of had all the decks stacked <laughs> against me. Um, but it took me a while to realize. I just thought, oh, I was not good enough, you know, like a lot of women do. But then I got introduced to some feminist writings by a really great group of women called Realisatrice Equitable. So that really helped me be like, no, it's not my fault. It's just, yeah, like you said, gaslighting, right? It's like, oh, I mean, I was told so many things like it's in English. We don't really fund English films that much. Or, yeah, but we don't really fund our films. So I guess I was being, in a way, gaslit. <laughs> but then I, I made slacks, and I knew. I was like, if I make slacks, I bet things are going to change, and people definitely take me more seriously now. So I think the stuff that might have been too obscure before, now people are going to pay attention to. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to get made, but at least now I've got like a, a foot in the door, and I've got a, I have a lot of great reviews, and slacks did really well, so people are going to actually listen and be like oh maybe you know she has something to say rather than be like oh this is too weird or like we're not sure you're ready for this how many times did i hear that (laughs) but but for climate activists to go back to your question i think climate activism 
It's more that people don't want to change or they don't want to really understand the amplitude of what's going on. Or even if they do, it's too much. I get it. Like they don't want to have to do anything because it's just too much once you really start to think about the magnitude of it. So I think it comes from a different place. But yeah, for sure, it's the the results can be similar, similarly frustrating. We already talked about your films or series in development. Are they too early? Do you want to go into talking about yeah. them? Or? Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, the one that I would say is the most relevant. Well, there's two. One that I've been working on for the most for the one of the longest ones I've been working on, and I would say which is particularly relevant, is called Night, Night of the Pendulum. It's a mini series set in the north of either Quebec or Ontario in the mining industry. So it's about a, a young engineer who is given by seemingly by accident a pendulum that starts to sort of mess with his mind and start to make him see different a different dimension of the world and of nature. And concurrently, there's a young woman in Ontario who starts to bleed from the ears, gets like this terrible ring in her ears, it bleeds from the ears, and then finds out her mother and her father died, who live in that small mining town. She moves back for the funeral. And she realizes that her, oh, I don't want to spoil it, but whatever, that let's just say that she and the mining engineer are tied together by an ancient curse. Um, but the curse has to do with how the mine has been able to mine gold for decades and why this mine is seemingly endless. And so it's a definite comment on extractivism and the greed behind um, the destruction of nature and how if people don't do anything about it and change their perspective, it's going to kill them. <laughs> so I like that one because it's like a supernatural mystery and those are my favorite. Then I have one called uh, Global Terror Inc. about a group of young activists who decide instead of just like marching or doing climate actions, decide to basically punish corporate malfeasance or corporate malfeta, I don't know how how you would say it, like corporate villains who are responsible for the climate and ecological emergency. And basically they just go out and torture and kill them. (laughs) <laughs> and they have a, like a, a grand plan. It's, it's like slacks in a way. So it's a critique on obviously corporations and, um, but it's funny. It's like humorous and satirical. So that one would be a lot of fun. And then I have a vampire series that I've been working on with the slacks co-writer Patricia gomez Latar for like 20 years. It used to be a feature and then it didn't quite work. And then we turned into a series. I don't know what's picked it up yet, but I think it would be a lot of fun. And then I have a feature film that I'm with the Slacks producers. It's a, more like a possession, like a bizarro possession story. I would, it's not a ghost story quite, but it's like a psychological possession story. So that one's, I'm rewriting that one and hopefully we can, we, we want to apply for financing in the fall. We'll see where that goes. Okay. So... You've, it sounds like you've got a lot going on there. Um, I do. I always do. <laughs> Maybe too much. And any of them hitting like the pre-production, like uh, a kind of stage where it looks like there might be a timeline for a release or they're no, all. No, no. Okay. They're all in like super, like the vampire one. We don't know what's there's No, the, the short answer is no No. okay (laughs) but they're more advanced some are more advanced than others so some have producers some don't so they're really all at different stages so and even the scripts are at different stages okay i I would i would like that but yeah (laughs) as a fan we're going when when's the next thing oh when's something gonna come up but um yeah take as long as you need because we don't want to rush you and and... (laughs) I want to rush myself and I find out I can't. Like, it, I just take a long time. I always say I'm a Pentium 2 processor. I just, like, it just takes me a while to get it right. Like, even if I force it, it just, it doesn't work. It just sort of, you know, I'll have, like, a spark and I'll be like, yes, okay, that's how we need to go. And then and then it usually goes pretty quickly once I'm like, okay, we need to do it like this until I hit that that point. And then it's like, you've done it, but then what do people think? Who's going to produce it? Who's going to fund it? Ah, 
that's all that's okay um so that's uh what's on the horizon for film and then as far as activism goes or anything to deal with the uh climate emergency do you have anything going on that way or any way you encourage people to uh to be involved in that well i don't have anything right now because being in morocco for another I'll, I'll have been here for six months like i'm really cut off from the activism world i'll see what happens when i come back like i'll try i get in touch with my my friends and see what's what's going on if i can get involved i don't know how but yeah i'll, I'll for sure keep my my toes in there and i organized a panel at fantasia last summer about like what we can do uh, what filmmakers can do so maybe i'll do that again and as far as pe- what people can do, I mean, you can get involved in some organization if you, there's so many ways to be involved, like just community gardens is one. It sounds like innocuous, but growing your own food is very important. Even like supporting local farmers, driving less, flying less, not eating as much red meat or meat or dairy, you know, reducing your consumption, reducing your need for unnecessary goods. You know, our society is really great at like making us want stuff and then once and then it breaks after five days and then you have to get something new because no one can repair it. But being in Morocco has really changed my outlook. Like people here, at least where I am, not everywhere, of course, I can't speak to all Moroccans, but there's this whole swath of, of population here in this town. They, they don't they're not poor necessarily i mean some are poor but you know some are middle class but they just don't have a lot of stuff you know you go to their house and there's almost nothing and i again it's not because they're poor because they'll have a big screen tv and some some have a car and their houses are very big but they just don't have a lot of stuff it's not in their mentality or they repair people still repair things out there you know or they just eat what's in season like my husband is a great one for just repairing things until until you can't repair them anymore. And he repairs them himself. I mean, he's very handy, but not everyone can do that. But just changing our our mentality instead of throwing things out or wanting the latest iPhone because just because it's come out, you know, just wait until your old one is not good anymore and then change it rather than like jumping on this fad and like fashion is just terrible. I mean, Slacks is all about that, but like overconsumption of fashion. If you go to a mall, if you start to see how how many clothing stores there are in our cities, in the malls, it's ridiculous. It's grotesque. Like just we're used to it. So we go walk in and they're like, oh yeah, it's like 80% clothing stores in the mall. But why? Like it's nuts. It's really, it's really nutty. So changing, trying to change your outlook about what you really, really need instead of what you want. And credit is so easy, has made it so easy for us. Like in Morocco, I think one of the reasons people don't have a lot of stuff is because it's really hard to get things on credit here. A lot of people can't have access to credit, so they have no choice. They can't buy it. But I also think some people just don't because that's not in their culture to to consume, which I think is good. So... So Try to like do like Southern Rockets and don't buy anything, you know, but just re, re, rethink what you need, you know, and, and just mm-hmm. make your life a bit. Which is a big change to our culture here in Canada. Like we're, we're wasters. We've been raised that way. We've, we've become used to it. It's, I mean, really looking at other cultures and seeing how we can adapt I mean, we think we're still superior with our technology and, and all that crap. But actually, when you look, when you turn the, change the way you look at things, it's, there's a lot of stuff about our culture that's really grotesque in a way, especially consumption, overconsumption and filling your every waking minute with, with stuff, you know, with information or emails or like we can't just sit still and just live you know we have to fill ourselves every which way and i think that's very problematic i could go on about why i think that is but 
but I do think it's like it's more a philosophical question in a, in a sense it's not just like or oh, corporate brainwashing brainwashing it's like a, a loss of of sense of what why we're here and what the point of our life is and so we can just fill it with stuff and useless information to stop us from thinking okay um <laughs> you know just cuz i just on a light note call it on a light note but i i do think that's part of the problem well i mean in a way light notes are we if, if things are emergencies mm-hmm. we should maybe be moving away from some of the light notes in our lives mm-hmm. um but anyways i think we've got a lot here and i really thank you for talking to me and yes. how do you wanted me to say again how special your movies have been for Aww. us and um so Thanks. yeah um so unless is there anything else you want to get out there to people that you can think of off the top of your head mm, i mean yeah that <laughs> We are in like a critical point in the history of humankind and that it's not a joke you know people are suffering and dying because of this the corporations are brainwashing us to and court governments to not think about it so it's time for people to wake up and take stock of of their lives and how they're contributing to this and what they can do to change to contribute it in a positive way so yeah, and do some, you know, do research, read about stuff and inform yourself. And when I started to read, I was like, oh, my God, where have I been all this time that I didn't know this shit? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah. it's up to us to inform well, ourselves. Yeah, I know exactly how that feels. Like, I've moved in the journalism I do. I realized how some of what i was writing was being edited because we didn't want to piss off sponsors or like uh uh, or advertisers and that sort of thing so um yeah i really see the way we we set things up in a way even when we cover you know corporate social responsibility um from banks and that and make it look like they're doing great things on one side. And oh, then, they're the worst. Exactly. On the other side, they're donating to the companies that are arresting indigenous protesters. Or yep. um, they're investing in the oil industry yep. on the other side. But they're planting trees, like you said, mm-hmm. on one side. It's it's crazy. So I, I found myself just moving away from the journalism that I had been trained to do um, because it's it's kind of depressing when you're doing one thing and want to see one thing happening and you end up knowing that you're just doing something that's perpetuating what you're you want to move against it's it's tough it's a good point I mean not everyone can afford to change jobs or change the way they live but i think people do owe it to themselves and to the rest of the world to take stock of what they can do you know can you change a job you know what one thing you can do which is pretty simple but i know it's irritating for a lot of people is to change banks to stop going into one of the top five especially rbc rbc is the worst the worst the worst so if you actually want to do something you change away from RBC and send them a letter, tell them why you're changing. But all the top five, TD, CIBC, BMO, Scotia, they all invest heavily in the oil and gas industry. So going to like a credit union, doing your research, that is that is something. Divesting, if you have investments, divesting from any investments in oil and gas, you know, telling your broker. And if you have, if you're lucky enough to have that, that you don't want like that, I have a small investment in my, I told my broker, I was like, I don't want any of this. And he was like, yeah, but there, I was like, no, I don't care how much money they make. I don't want it. And he was like, all right. You know, so there's so many small things we can do. And I know 
some people think like small things don't matter and I used to be someone like I used to be like that in the heydays of my like activism I was like small steps don't matter but they do if everyone leaves RBC because they're like fuck you then okay they're not necessarily going to go bankrupt that's or it's going to hurt them mm-hmm. it's going to send a message so do it come on you guys change banks <laughs> <laughs> okay um so yeah like uh like i said it's been great to talk to you so me too. i thank you very much for taking the time to do this me too me too okay. no, it was great it was nice to nice to chat all right thanks bye bye <laughs>
Finishing off this episode, that was Corporageddon. Once again, that was Dan Burt No Bacon, Kyra Wood Kramer, and the Axis of Descent. Thanks to Elza for the interview. Check the description wherever you are listening to this for more information about her movies and possible series, or visit woodstein.ca. That's W O O D hyphen. S-T-E-I-N dot C-A. You can support this podcast by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Colin Burroughs. Like, share, comment, follow, and support Woodstein Media and this podcast, and have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.